is the Omega Group. Is that correct? A virtual uh, agency. Mm -hmm. uh, I brought one of the pieces of stationery that I had in those days. Where was it? It's here someplace. These people, I knew them all, and what we had, the relationship we had was, was philosophical, not legal. Uh, they were all active in the specialties that you see, and the agreement was that any time that I had need for their kind of uh, expertise, and if they were available, they would work then with me under the umbrella of MEGA. And what it did is gave me, as an individual, uh, an enormous range of capabilities. Right, so and this is this interdisciplinary team approach. Yeah, you know, right. Wow, and I'd, uh, can I take this? You, of course, comment? of course. Okay, great. Some of these people are dead now. Right. <laughs> but, uh, no, but this is good. Uh, this is great. But that was the concept. Mm -hmm. And it worked reasonably well. Not perfectly, reasonably well. I think if I had to do it over again, I would not have made it so voluntary. I would have tied them a little more conscientiously by giving them a modest fee or something. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to get involved in that. But uh, as I said, I know them all, do them all. And it was really, at one point, you can have this. I. Uh, Summarized, I wanted to see what I was doing. I summarized the work from, we started in 1990, and this is an accounting, 2003. Uh, this is not typed very well, but that's all right, <laughs> because of the, the copy I have. Oh, in that period, 1990, 2003, Ten of these people were engaged 21 times in projects. So to that degree, it worked. What those projects were is all in here. Uh, I don't know what you do with written material, but you may have that. I'll scan it and create PDF files. and. I'll then I also created, at that time, uh, an imprint service, which is Turtle. The reason for Turtle. When I left Bayer, I was determined not to have a going away party because I was mad. But I had my own. And what I created was the select order of the turtle. A turtle does not move until it sticks his neck up. Obvious, right? right. So I selected, in my judgment, a dozen people who I had worked with, some as buyer, some not, uh, as initial uh, honorees. And we gave them a little ceramic turtle on a mahogany base. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I've honored people just, maybe they don't think it's an honor. And we can wonderful certificates, you know, mm -hmm. on parchment, all la bologna. I remember. <laughs> I gave one to David Ogilvy, because I've always admired him. Oh, he says, that's wonderful. I'll put it in my loo. <laughs> I guess that's where he hung all those awards, though. So that was, that was fun. And I have used, then I used this as an imprint service, because before my first book, I had outlined a book on credibility. I had written a sample chapter. Uh, I had a complete marketing plan because it was a niche book. All my books are niche books. And I knew exactly who to go after. And I was working with an editor of McGraw Hill, who was younger than I. Almost everybody I worked with was younger than I. This was a long time ago. And she kept finessing me and rewriting it. And I said, she doesn't know what the hell this is all about. So I got tired. So I decided I'd do it myself. I had a good friend who 
was the editor of a, a very successful weekly up in Connecticut, but more importantly, he had two big gospel presses. I had a good friend who's in that list there who was a wonderful graphics man. So we put together a little cottage industry and I rewrote, I wrote the book. And I found it was easy when I didn't have to worry about anybody looking at it and editing about myself. And that was Street Smart Public Relations. And I promoted the hell out of it. Um, sent out fortune cookies appropriately with me. Uh, and I also sent out to quote a select list, uh, a velvet pouch with six pebbles in it and a ping pong ball. And a little doggerel that said, if you throw the ping pong ball in the water, you, nothing much happens. Throw the pebbles and you can see the waves. And I built on that. And the proceeds from that book have subsequently underwritten some of the others. And all I ever look for in the various books that I've done, here's some of them, uh, is break even. Because I like to write now, and uh, so these just keep proliferating and so forth. And you, I have one you may have. I don't have all that I should have because I had a huge inventory at home in Connecticut, and the house burned to the ground, oh. and so did all my records and all, and all my inventory. Oh. That was uh, several years ago. If we, if we had been at home and not in our New York apartment, I wouldn't be talking to you. Right to, um, when I say to the ground, I mean flat, flat. It was a 10-room house on 15 acres. So, any anyway, rate, what's your next question? And, and it's an invitation only. Only, yeah, because I got a very eclectic mailing list. A lot of his lawyers and CEOs and consultants and, and I will say, senior PR people. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I try to do in it is interpret in the context of public opinion uh, what's going on and what you should do about it. Uh, in other words, the way that even if you're thought of as a communicator in a company or in an agency representing a company, one of the ways you can earn your way into a counseling mode is by taking the initiative and sending memos or whatever to the CEO and say, look, this is just such and such is happening, and this is what might happen, and this is what we ought to think about. And this is what I try to point out here, and hoping to give clues what you might do. But public relations is a very individualistic business. There are those who have, have, where ambition is more the just a word in a dictionary, and they really believe it. They will move and they will do it, and they will succeed. And there are successful people in the business. They're much in the minority. Uh, so be it. This is another talk I gave way back when. Okay, but yes, yes. This is typical of some of the white papers I do. Writer. Wow. All, and this was something I conceived of, but it was unsuccessful. I thought that, and I know why it wasn't successful. CEOs would welcome the advice of a retired CEO uh, who they could talk with with impunity, whereas they might be hesitant letting their hair down with anyone on the board. Yeah, so what I didn't, and we had a few assignments, and I signed, it, signed up again philosophically, as like I said before, a half dozen, uh, maybe eight uh, 
retired senior executives who thought it was a good try. Uh, what I didn't really count on is how immune sitting CEOs are to advice. Uh, my thesis was correct, I know that. And you can see it now by the short tenure the CEOs have. But this was a little too avant-garde for them. This being the CEC, which is the Chief Executive's Council of the Omega Group. Right. right. So, but it was, it was a, a good idea, it didn't fly. 